Humanity has been driven from Earth, but now it's time to take it back. Join the reconquest and fight the scourge on the Drop Zone Commander Hub at beastsofwar.com. Flames of War brings you the battles of World War II in epic 15mm scale. Go to the hub on beastsofwar.com to find news, tactics and tutorials about the game. Hi right, guys, welcome to What's in the Box. As you can see, I'm joined by John, and it is time for more tank tank gibberish. Yep. And uh, by the way, we're unboxing a Firefly. Yep, we certainly are. Uh, the Sherman VC Firefly. Yes. So uh, is is this? I'll assume this is British. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is pure British. Okay, so the Firefly, what has changed from the American variant? Right. Well, if yeah, right. Okay. So the British had the the Sherman Five, which yep. is called the M4A4. Um, before, I think just around the time in Normandy, they were already researching ways to upgun the Sherman. And the Americans had their projects. They had the 76 millimeter. They had the, the Sherman 105 as well, where they had the, the howitzer mounted in it and stuff like that. Um, the British hadn't really bothered too much with the standard Shermans up to this point because they were sort of thinking, well, it's still good enough. Yeah. Um, but after Africa and uh, when they encountered the tiger in Tunisia and stuff like that, they yeah. started to get a little bit worried and they were thinking if there's going to be a lot of these things, we're going to need guns that are going to do the job. Yeah, well, I mean, like, in any war, you do have that sort of a, a guessing game of, okay, they now, I've now had reports of this tiger, this vehicle. Yeah. How quickly can they produce them? We don't know what's underneath all that armour. Yep. For all I know, there's a hamster wheel in the back of it and they can just mass produce this thing. The, the scariest part was once they took the Tiger in Tunisia, the one that's currently in Bovington, mm. they, they stripped the tank down completely, they dismantled the entire tank, they took pictures of every part, yeah. and made a manual, basically made a, a British manual. Really? Then they rebuilt it and then they took it to um, trials. Right, I would not want to be trying to rebuild that thing. No. <laughs> you know, it's just, okay, well, I've taken it apart, now, now what? Uh... So yeah, they took the tank to trial, Aye. and they drove it around, they fired it with a British crew in it to see yep. how it behaved and how it acted and everything. And it was that report that is the primary source material for all Tiger tanks today. It's the best source material, right. but it's the part of the whole thing that scared the British the most. Right. It wasn't, they weren't worried about the armour as such, they knew it was going to be formidable, they weren't worried about the engine or anything like that. What they were scared about, really, really scared about, was the gunnery, uh -huh. and basically the actual capability of the gun. Right, well, I mean, like, I suppose if you stick a British crew into a Tiger, mm -hmm. that is the most inexperienced crew you're going to really get your hands on. Yep. You know, and if, if they're good in it, and actually effective in it, yep. Yeah, as soon as you think, okay, if there's a train crew in this, this thing suddenly becomes, holy crap, that's deadly. Yeah, the fact that the, the thing that made Britain really push a project like Firefly, even if they didn't officially, um, <laughs> was that the, the German tanks, and particularly, they, they already knew about the Panther. Yes. The, the Russians had seen them at Kursk and had captured them and were feeding back to the Western Allies on what it could do. Yeah. And they were getting scared because the German tanks were now able to engage a Sherman tank beyond its capability. Right, so, beyond its effective range. Yeah, so a Sherman would have to get within about, I think they say about 600 yards, about 580 metres or something to mm. be relatively effective against a Panther on the side or a Tiger on the side. Right. What they were finding was that the, the Tiger when it's front on and the Panther when it's front on, you need to be within 200 metres or less. Right. To be effective. And combat range is meant to be 500 meters. So b b basically, you have a long range sniper on the German side, and the British and Americans are coming in having to go, right, we're needing a knife fight here. This is not fun. Yep. So when, you, when they looked at it all, they went, right. The Americans took their own ideas and ran off with it. So they came up with the M10. Mm -hmm. They came up with the, the M, later the M18 Hellcat, then the M36. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they kept those as tank destroyer battalions. Yeah. What changed with the British was they thought, yeah, we have tank destroyer units, but they're Royal Artillery. What do we do for the armoured? Yeah, now this instantly jumps out and feels weird to me that they've kept their tank destroyers in with Royal Artillery. Yeah. You know, that, that doesn't really make a connection with me that those two should be kept together instead of going, okay, tank destroyers in with the tank divisions. Mm -hmm. Well, the way the, the thinking was that a tank destroyer isn't a mobile like isn't a fire on the move weapon. Yeah. Um, so a tank destroyer is essentially a mobile artillery piece. It may be an anti-tank gun, but it is artillery. Uh, again, that that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Because <laughs> I mean, like, uh, 
if it's set with an artillery unit. Mm -hmm. I expect artillery units to be way, way back at the lines, you know, completely at the, the sharp end of things, yeah. you know, unless a breakthrough happens or something like that, yeah. in which case, fair enough, our artillery is now defended by tank destroyers, which can probably shred whatever's in front of it, you know, but other than that, it, it feels as if the tank destro the destroyer should be up in like a second line behind yeah. the main actual fighting line, so that if something does go wrong, they can dig in, your forces can pull back, and now you have a wall of death behind you. Yeah. But what started to change was when they realised that the main battle tank, the Sherman, wasn't going to do it anymore. It mm. just wasn't going to cut it. And in the first few weeks in Normandy, it really did show that it just wasn't capable of taking on this bigger stuff. Mm. Even the Panzer IV, the later vo version Panzer IV, the Fs and the Hs, the, they just couldn't do it. Yeah, it's, well, they were the ones that they had all the, the shirts in and stuff on to actually deal with shape charges and stuff. Yep. And then even just a regular Panzer IV on its own, that is still a very, very nasty vehicle. Yep. I mean, a Panzer IV, before it was really upgraded, once it had the long 75, it was, it was able to kill a Sherman at a safe range, but a Sherman could still take one out, probably. Right, you're sort of on a level playing field at that yeah. point. You yeah. leveled it out a bit, it just came down to the crew Aye. after that, and you know, how capable are they, how confident are they in the machine? What crowds are they on? Yep. Right. You, you find that the confidence really was lacking in the... the the Western Allied tank crews because they knew that they couldn't do it. Aye. And what they found out was, in some instances, if a Tiger turned up, sometimes even if a Panzer IV turned up, because at 800 metres, you can't tell that silhouette's a Panzer IV compared to a Tiger. Yeah, again, a lot with, of, with that shirt on, the, the sides and stuff to change the silhouette. Yep. And some tank crews just bailed out. If they thought there was a Tiger in the area, they, they got out. Really? They either took the tank back, or if they couldn't pull back, they got out and ran off. Bloody hell. That's... I don't blame them. Because True. if they were firing at, if it was a, a real tiger in front of them, mm. there's nothing they can do. I suppose. I suppose. <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's get on to the kit, because there's only a couple of changes to this yep. between it and the, the, the Noble Sherman 5. five. So yep. The first brew you'll have seen a few times before, it's the, the lower hull, the tracks, and the actual suspension system. Mm -hmm. Nothing new here. No. We move across, we have our accessory sprue with our commanders, spare wheels, jerry cans, Collins Hedgerow Cutter, uh, 50 cal, 50 cal ammo box. Uh, what is this again? That's the trigger assembly. Yeah, that's the trigger assembly. You've then got the, the two back boxes. You've yep. got the extension for the actual turret. Mm -hmm. You've then got uh, just a storage bin that goes on the back. You've got spare track here. You've got these, which you told me are fire extinguishers. Mm -hmm. We've then got all your lights, your towing hooks, your towing eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got this, which is your med, med pack. Mm -hmm. You've got this, which is two more towing hooks, yep. and I think that's about it for that sprue, and of course the side skirts that go on to this thing. Mm -hmm. Now, building this kit, would you actually leave those side skirts on or off? Is it just purely optional, or would you actually put them on? Um, you can put them on. There's footage of them being used in Normandy on Sherman 5s and on Fireflies, but they, they're they only sheet metal. They're only 3 mil sheet metal. So yeah. Well, I mean, if you wanted to do some nice damage to them, you could do this sort of dent it and shred it a little bit. Yeah. You know, it might be a cool way to do it. Yeah. Right, let's get on to the business end of things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the sprue in this kit, which changes. So this is your main hull. Yeah. So everything's standardized there. Yeah. No. No? What's changed no. here? The bow machine gun is gone. Aha, I see. So there's an, an armoured housing over where the, uh, the machine gun would have been. Okay. Uh, there's also, on the Sherman 5, there's a gun rest at the front here for the main gun. Uh -huh. On Firefly, it's moved to the back of the engine deck. Ah, I see. Okay, uh, moving across, we have the hatches for your commander's cupola, which is here. Yep. We've got these two components. Where do they go again? They're for the front of the transmission there for uh, here. So here? Yep. Uh, we've got this, which is the... Back of the engine back bay. Back of the engine bay, yep. Yep. Uh, you've then got the gun mount and the gun mantlet, which yep. is here and here. Uh, you've then got the rear storage bin, which goes onto the hull. Mm -hmm. You've got your drive sprockets as well. You then got your turret. Anything really changed here? Yes, they they added a second hatch here. This square hatch. They added uh -huh. a, they added this because um, with the seventeen pounder in the turret, you weren't able to get to the loader's position. Okay, you weren't able to sneak in under it. No. And obviously, we do have our seventeen pounder here. Mm -hmm. So, it's it's a very very nice kit. It doesn't need a lot of changes to actually bring you from one to the other. So yep. if you've built your Sherman fives before, yep. you're going to know how to build a Firefly. Mm -hmm. you know, pretty much. Pretty much. Uh, other than that. You also get your instructions in here, which are just a nice little set of 3D instructions that are going to take you through each and every step of what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. if the light wouldn't shine on it and make it incredibly hard to see. <coughs> <laughs> and lastly, you're going to get your transfer sheet. Mm -hmm. Now, John, for the actual transfer sheet, 
These are all British markings, yes? Yes. With uh, some of the standardised stuff just to show they're allied. So the White Star was always a standardised thing. Yep. You then have your unit markings and then your actual platoon markings, which are the blue square, yellow triangle, red square. Well, these would, uh, in this case, these would be your squadron markings as well. Right. They're called in the British. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, like, between unit markings, I assume that's your overall battalion, and then you go down to sort of the, the lower level with the shapes and colours, yeah? Well, you actually, if you bring it back up under, under close cam, mm -hmm. Um, all these symbols, let me see if I can get these symbols here. Yeah. These are divisional markings. Okay. So this is the big division. This is the overall mothership. Yeah. So for, uh, because I like Irish guards, Irish guards wore the all-seeing eye. So if you go back uh, there. Yeah, so it's this little uh, it's the blue, blue and shield. red one, the second one down here. Yep, it's the blue shield with the all-seeing eye in the middle of it. Yeah. That's the division. Mm -hmm. uh, next to that. If you're looking at a, a tank troop or a tank squadron, yep. they would then use one of those red squares with the numbers in them. Right, so would that be any of them? So anything from up here and anything from down the bottom here? Well, yeah, more or less. Um, the three-digit numbers, I believe, might be something else. Okay. Generally, armoured troops or armoured squadrons or regiments mm. used a two-digit number. Okay. Um, five denoted that it was an armoured regiment. Okay. And the number after the five was which regiment it is. So zero, one, two, and three. Yep. And so then what about the the blue and green one with the forty five on it that's here? Uh, the blue and green, I believe, is if I'm trying to think, I think it's possibly a Canadian marking. Okay. Um, but the Canadians will have had their own unit yep. markings on top of that. Yeah. For the Irish Guards, uh, -huh. uh on the front of the tank, you would have seen the all-seeing eye on one side. Yes. On the second side, or uh, on the other side, you would have seen fifty three. Okay. Uh, 53 denoting that it was Armoured Regiment 3. Aye. Uh, squadron markings, if you're looking at, uh, let's go with um, Operation Just, Market Garden. Okay. Which, which is uh, September 1944. You're looking at the blue squadron markings. So the blue square here, yeah? Yep. The blue denoted it was the junior regiment of the division. Okay. Uh, so in the, the Armoured Battalion, it was the, the junior regiment. Right. So it went from blue, red, to yellow to white. Okay. I think white was the HQ. Okay. Okay. Or was the, the most experienced regiment right. in there? Well, guys, whenever you're putting your transfers down, you know, just watch this again. Let John's gibberish wash over you. <laughs> and then just put on whatever the hell you want. Okay. I tell you what, we'll take a quick break here because I actually want to see this thing sit and built. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll be back in a second. Okay, we're back and we have our Sherman Firefly built. Mm -hmm. It is a fantastic kit once it's actually put together, John. It's it, really got that nice, mean look to it. The one thing I am wondering, you see on the turret here, mm -hmm. you've got your extension, which, yes, I understand why you need it, because mm -hmm. it'll spit the radio set out the back. Yep. Uh, but would they actually have attached the, the container on the back here, the bin? Yes. So it would have actually went on there? They, that's where the bin should have been on the normal Shermans anyway. Um, right. So when they extended the turret, they never considered to put to it somewhere it. else. Yeah. All right, uh, well, as we, we spin around, the vehicle is really, really nice, and having that, that long-barreled gun, just it changes the profile of the, the, the vehicle very, very much. Mm -hmm. What would you say was the defining characteristic of this tank once it got the gun upgrade? Because it's, it's the one thing we always talk about. In armoured warfare, you have the three options that you can only sort of ever really have two of. So you've mm -hmm. got its mobility, its firepower, and its armour. Yeah. Well, survivability. Yeah. So what what did the, what really changed in this? Because I'm guessing the gun actually upped the weight significantly. I'm going to say a bit. Um, you actually found the performance was ne was there was a negligible difference between the two. Really? Yeah. The the 75 mil and 17 pounder guns. The weight difference is about quarter to half a ton. Okay. Something like that. All right. Um, so extra half ton on a big engine. Not really going to let's, make a difference. Let's say that the, the turret extension also adds another quarter ton. So you're looking maybe about a half ton to three quarter ton heavier. To, okay, heavier. So, but you have the thirty cylinder multi bank engine in this thing. That's mm. pumping out four hundred and ninety horsepower. Yeah, but it's also got a huge amount of torque behind it, so it doesn't matter. I the see. engine would barely have noticed the weight difference. Right. So it's basically the tank didn't really mind about its horsepower so long as it had the grunt to do it. Yep. The only other major weight difference would be the ammunition. Right. Um, Sherman 75s carried about 93 rounds or 96 rounds of 75 mil, yeah. and that's roughly about six pound in weight. Okay. Then you go to 17 pounder. Yeah. And 17 pounder has a bigger shell casing. Yeah. Has a bigger projectile and mm. weighs 17 pounds. Yeah. Okay. Hence, hence the designation. So 
the ammunition fully stocked up in this thing, which is why they removed the bow machine gun mm. to allow more ammunition to get into the thing. Really? Yeah. Had to extend the ammo racks out. I think they had to get rid of the, the assistant driver. So it's actually a four-man crew. So, so hang on. You're telling me this hatch here is now just for dropping shells down inside? Essentially, that, that position is redundant in the tank, yeah. How would you even get to that? Because I mean, like, I know from here going down, you'll have your turret basket. Yeah. Your turret would actually have to turn till one of the openings matches that. Yeah. And then you actually need to start feeding your shells back up in. Yeah. So I, I'm guessing whatever you were holding in your ready racks was what you had for an engagement. Then you needed to pull out and actually restock your ready racks. Yep. I, I think on 75 Shermans, you had maybe about 14 rounds of ready rack ammunition. Mm. Um, well, yeah, 14 rounds is still a fair amount of shoot. 14 rounds is fine, then the left hand side of the turret basket is open, mm -hmm. which allows the loader to reach down into the side ammo racks that are on the, yeah. in the, the sides, but for major problems or major issues, mm. they're going to have to pull back, as you say, bring the turret round and start feeding stuff up into the ready rack again. Yeah. Now, that, that was actually the one problem. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about Fury. Yeah. And it was the problem I had with Fury. Mm -hmm. Because, yes, I know it's, it's not this particular vehicle here, but I can use this as an example. Because once you were actually inside this vehicle, if I can... Yeah, 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 yeah. It just, just straight off. Does it just pop? Yeah. All right. Sorry, I thought it was one of the nice little lock ones. Whenever you were down inside it, you actually saw that you had no turret basket in the actual vehicle in the movie, and that just feels really, really weird to me. Yeah. You know, I understand why it was done, because they needed to shoot in and around it and see what was going on, mm -hmm. but was that a modification, I wonder, to that particular spec of tank? I doubt it. I think easy it was just the, the, the regular turret basket, Aye. I think. Aye. I could be wrong, but I don't well, know. Well, it's, it's one for the comments. It's something I'm curious about because, I mean, like, I've been in a Sherman, you know, the one you and your dad had, mm -hmm. and the big turret basket, it didn't leave you a lot of room to actually get in no. at your ammo, ammo storage and stuff. I remember when you got into it after we put the turret on, and the, once the gun and the turret are on inside that basket, you're just sat there going, yeah. well, this is good. You know, <laughs> whenever she was about to go to, uh, to France, yep. you had the, the turret and all in. And, you know, I jumped in and I was looking around going, how do you even move around in here? You know, yeah. how do you live and fight from this tiny, tiny cramped space? Yes, it's a big vehicle, but every bit of space is just filled with equipment whenever it's fully the, done. The most hilarious part was, you know, when you see a lot of films and people are stood up in the tanks, especially the loaders, and they're stood up and they're like, yeah, and, you know, you see your guy in Fury like reaching up really high to hit that hatch above him. Uh, um, if I can demonstrate, when we got into my Sherman, yeah, you had to stand like that. Yeah. All the time, because yeah. the turret roof was here. Yes. <laughs> yes. You've got maybe, what, about five foot of space? About that, yeah. You know, and I'm, yes. I'm 5'11", and I'm just like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was cramped. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, like, it is impressive, you know, that guys lived and fought from these vehicles for, for however long they were, mm -hmm. from Normandy to Berlin. You know, it, it was just mental, absolutely mental, how much they had to do. But... That's my thought. But this this is Firefly though. This is so much cooler than an Easy Eight, because <laughs> this this is the the little tank that couldn't, and they turned it into the little tank that could, <laughs> really really well. I mean, well, like, it, it's it's the thing I have to wonder mm. is the first time Firefly rolled out onto the battlefield and engaged with German armor. That must have been such a wake up call for the Germans, just going, oh, there's there's a, a Sherman platoon over there. All right, let's 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 go get them. Why has what? hands just exploded? Yeah. <laughs> why does why does that one look mildly different? One of these things is not like the others. Oh god, I'm dead. <laughs> they probably knew about Firefly. Mm. They probably knew when they started to see the the allies coming ashore and stuff like that, and they seen mm. the first of them. They went, "That's not right." They would have been, they would have um, seen seventeen pounder before because it was a tow dandy tank gun before that. Yeah. So they would have had engagements with them, but mm. as a concealed anti-tank gun. Ah. So they'd have had that fear already, and then all of a sudden, the tank troops are getting them, like one, one Firefly per troop of four, yeah. and you're just like, oh, actually, they have a lot more of these than we thought. You know? now, this was something I always wondered. Mm. Was the 17-pounder a lot harder to produce? Because um, I'm, al I'm always left to wonder why it was only one to a troop. Why was there only one guy that could actually kick out that damage instead of having two or three of them in a troop? I have a feeling it was a bit of an argument between the artillery and the tank troop. Really? I have a feeling it's a bit of a... The, the infantry need towed anti-tank guns. We have 17-pounders, we need to make them for the, the infantry. Yeah. In the meantime, the armoured corps are going at, at Chobham and down in Dorset, they're going, 
but we could use 17 pounder. We need a tank that has 17 pounder, and everyone is just going, no, you can't have them. Yes, we want them. No, you can't have them. So it's that constant struggle you have with the, the quartermasters in any army going, look, I need this gear. I don't have this gear to give you. But you just give that gear to him, and I see more on the rack behind you. Look, I'm sorry, I don't have any for you. Yeah. The biggest joke of Firefly is that initially they didn't want it at all. Mm -hmm. Because the project was taken on by, I believe it was a, a little English engineer who thought, I have a great idea. Mm. And he, he said, right, we need to get... 17 pounder. Yeah, into we need to get this in that. Yeah. The the initial plan, Firefly was a stopgap. Mm. Firefly wasn't an intentional battle tank. Um, it was actually a stopgap because we were already developing Centurion. Mm -hmm. um, Centurion's development started in 1943, mm -hmm. um, but it didn't see service till 45 and the war was over at that point. Yeah. So we, they thought, well, we have 17 pounder. What the hell are we going to do with it? And this guy went, I can put it in a Sherman. And they went, <laughs> go Get away. And then he went, right, fine. We'll, we'll, we'll show you. Uh, so he went off and he, in the Osprey book, says, acquired a Sherman. I love that one word. It, it, not purloined, not requisitioned, acquired. Acquired one. And apparently there is no official paperwork of him ever actually requesting one. <laughs> <laughs> he just got one. And, uh, how do you even do that? Yeah, and then he managed to get a 17 pounder as well. I think that became a bit more official since it was a friggin' gun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, did he just turn up at the factory or the landing one day and just go, uh, lads, I'm, I'm here to pick up a vehicle for testing. Yes, all official, all official. Just yeah, look, just, just give me the keys. I'm, I'm going to put it on the flatbed here. Don't worry, it's fine. It's all official. It's official. I swear to God, it's official. If I want to throw a, a little conspiracy theory out there, I'd like it. I would really have loved it if I could travel back in time and actually follow this guy around to see what he did to get one because I could imagine he went on to like, you know, when they were training for D-Day, the Yorkshire Moors or something, and he walked up to a tank crew and said, I'll give you two cases of beer if you report that thing sunk in a bog. <laughs> <laughs> if see, you can drive it to <coughs> this yard yeah. by this time without being seen, uh, and the crew went, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I could imagine it was something crazy like that, and a, a form went in at one point in the British Army that said, oh, you know, such and such a regiment lost the yeah. Sherman in a yeah. bog, you know. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the vehicle lost in training accident, please replace immediately. Yeah, <laughs> so this guy got the Sherman, got the um, the 17 pounder and started to Take basically... Her basically take a sledgehammer to the damn thing until it fitted because that's the only way I can imagine this thing fitting well, in. Square peg, round hole. Square peg, round hole that actually worked out pretty <laughs> well. Aye. Well, I mean, like, it's a beautiful kit. Once mm -hmm. it gets down on the tabletop for your games, it's incredibly deadly. Game-wise, it's a super heavy anti-tank gun on a medium tank. Yeah, anytime I see these things rolling out on the table against me, I'm just looking at it going, well, you're going to die first. Yeah, you have to die. <laughs> yeah, at which point you're going, nope, I'm, I'm just going to play the hiding game. And Oh, look, I can poke out and get shot. Ah! It's more if I can get enough tanks on the table. If, we, if you and I play Tank War, it's literally going to be, here's my Firefly, but I'm going to put the other Shermans in your face first. Yes, here's everything in front of it. Okay, lads, spread out, and Firefly, do your thing. It's, bit, it's like pulling back a curtain, and it's like, and our main event. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> All right, well, I'll tell you what, guys. Uh, drop your comments in below. Tell us, what do you know of the history of the Firefly? Because I know John knows it. I know we, we had that beautiful little story about the guy who acquired one. <laughs> Uh, but if you have any information yourselves, I would really like to hear it because this is one of those vehicles from history which it has so much character. Mm -hmm. I just I want to learn more about it. Can I throw one more in? Okay, one more. Uh, do we have enough time? You have one we minute. Have, have... <gasps> right. <laughs> the Fireflies were given the best crews in the troop, right? Yeah. Um, so it was the best gunners, the best loaders, the best commanders all got the Fireflies. Yeah. One problem with the, the 17 pounder, because yeah. it's an anti tank gun, uh -huh. because it's designed to be a towed artillery piece. Yes. It needs a lot of run back to allow the shell casing to come out. Yeah. The automatic system on the gun mm -hmm. means that when the gun runs back, the breech automatically opens and ejects the shell casing. Yeah. But they had to bring the recoil of the gun down from, I think, was it 14 inches to 10 inches. Right. So they had to stiffen all the springs up, get different oils and recoil mechanisms in there. Yeah. But the gun still did that. When it recoiled, it threw the breech down and chucked the shell out. Aye. But because the recoil was shorter, it had a shorter length of time to go Oh, I need to open now. So when it did that inside the turret of a Sherman, all the propellant hadn't burned out of the casing. All oh, right. So when yeah, the breach when the breach went down, the shell casing came out, and as Joe Atkins said, 
woof, there would be a flame around the inside of the turret. <laughs> this is flash flame around the inside of the turret. And they, they, they said in British troops, you could always tell the firefight crew because they had no eyebrows. <laughs> and they had no hair below the, the line of their berry. <laughs> so that's where that haircut came from. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, guys, drop your comments in below. Let us know, what do you think of the Sherman Firefly? Do you use it in your games of bolt action? We'll move on here. We will see you in the next video. Become a general of mighty armies at the Kings of Warhub. Take command of elves, dwarves and orcs in this game of masked fantasy combat on beastsofwar.com. Venture into the dangerous dungeons of myth as a mighty hero and stand against the darkness. Visit the Myth Hub on beastsofwar.com and begin your story.